Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are all doing well today. I'm, um... I saw that there were a number of you already kind of hanging out here early, and I always super appreciate that. Um, welcome to day 13 of... Doop, 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 doop. Where did it go? It's behind everything. There it is. Invertober, right? So we've been spending every night live streaming, doing all types of wonderful things. Um, today, we are going to be doing a brand new sketch under the microscope because it's a Thursday and that's what we do every Thursday night, whether or not it's Invertober or any other Thursday of the year. Um, we go live at 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, that's also 7 p.m. Pacific if you are over there on the West Coast. I say hi, and um, I hope you're still enjoying your son. Ours is gone. Oh, hi, Hashi. I received your contact, and I will be um, and I will be reaching back out. Just I'll be reaching out shortly. Um. All right, so we have this beautiful insect over here to my left, and hi, Deb. <clears throat> I have this beautiful insect over here to my left, and its scientific name is Pseudomythoca simula. And this is a species of a type of insect. I actually, I think I gave it away in the chat box. I was going to ask you what types of characteristics you see on this velvet ant, but... I gave it away. So, um, we've got these really awesome mandibles up here in the front. We're looking at this, at this velvet ant head on because when I was looking at this velvet ant earlier and I was just, I was just, you know, poking around, see what type of textures it had, you know, what, what we could look at. And then I turned it and I looked at it head on and I thought, I need to pause this image and share it with my friends. <laughs> Because I just thought he was kind of cute and kind of scary all at the same time. So I figure that is a pretty good image to start Invert-tober's episode 13. Um, you know, lucky or unlucky, who knows. So, um, this is a species of velvet ant. And all velvet ants are in the family Mutility. Um... And even though we technically call them, um, even though we technically call them velvet ants, they are not true ants because ants have their own family and it's completely different. So mutilids or velvet wasps, velvet ants are actually um, more like a different type of wasp um, without any wings. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off our camera over here. It'll flip our camera over and we're gonna look at my velvet ant as full as we can get maybe we'll be able to get its entire yes we should be able to get its entire body into our camera which will be good because I can get you an exact measurement from the microscope just needs a little more light come on guys There. There's a little more light. All right. So I'm going to be measuring my velvet ant from all the way up here in the front of its head to what looks like the back of its abdomen. I'm going to go just a tiny bit further because I can see that the abdomen is like curled around and I want it to be as straight of a measurement as possible. So something like this. All right. That's close, but I'm going to switch it. I had it over in inches for my students earlier, so I'm switching it back to centimeters for my nature journal or scientist friends. Um, and the measurement on this velvet ant from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen is 1.15 centimeters long. Um, so there you go. I know that a lot of us like that measurement. So 1.15 centimeters. Um, when I had it in inches, it was just a little bit less than a half an inch, essentially. Interesting.
interesting antenna, like a like a bull's horn. I um I think that's an interesting observation, and yeah, it's kind of like there's that um there's the straight part, and then it kind of curls back like that, kind of like this odd horn. Um, when these ants, um, or when these velvet ants are kind of walking along the ground, they look more like they have, um, they don't naturally hold their antenna like that. Um, oh no! I think my light just fell over. Sometimes I think the cats kick the tripods. <laughs> yeah, it looks kind of like a scythe. But I'll show you. If we turn our specimen sideways. Uh, not sideways enough. There. It's less of a scythe and more of a curly cue. So these uh, these wasps, these velvet ants, they have elbowed antenna. So they have that first section, the scape, that is really, really long. And then they have a very short pedestal. And then the flagellum is here. And there's many segments. And the idea is when they hold it, they are, it's kind of shaped like elbows. Um, and that's how they kind of feel around. But yeah, ram's horn. It looks very much like it's curled in. I totally see the horn from here. Yep. Ah, Hashi asks, can I name the parts of the antenna again? Of course I can. So there are three main parts of the antenna. The scape is going to be this first segment of the antenna right here. It's really, really long. In this type of antenna, it's really long. But generally, the purpose of the scape is um, structural and like connection to the head. So generally, it's that first it's that first segment segment of the antenna that connects the antenna to the head. So normally, it's pretty strong and powerful in comparison to all of the other ones. Then, so you have the scape. Then you have the pedestal. And the pedestal sits right after the scape. It is the second segment of the antenna. And in this antenna, it's right about here. And that one helps with all of the flexibility and the movement, right? So we've got the really strong one that's mostly sturdy and can kind of do this. But then you have the pedestal at the end um, that gives that there's a lot of rotation in. Um, and so that's kind of the purpose of the pedestal is to give a little bit of like that ability to move and stuff. And then we have the flagellum. Shrink the words and bring them over. Make them fit. Make them fit. There we go. All right. Um, then we have the flagellum, and that is all of the rest of the segments of our antenna. So if we're looking here, all of these individual segments all together kind of make up the flagellum. Yep, the scape is just one segment. There's the first segment is the scape, the second segment is the pedestal, and the rest of the segments are the flagellum. Flagella is... Flagella is the individual or the singular word for flagellum, but I don't think that they call them individually flagella. I think that they call them antennal segments because at that point, um, you're either talking about the part as a whole or you're talking about antennal segments 3 through 6 or antennal segments 10 through 15. Um, is generally how they'll kind of list them and name them when you're working in keys. Alrighty. Um, because we're still kind of just moving all over the body, um, I did want to show you one more characteristic before I started getting focused and sketching really hard. 
And that is right here. <clears throat> so, here's the thing. Female velvet wasps do not have wings. Yeah. Male velvet wasps, male velvet ants, um, sometimes we call them velvet wasps because they're not true ants, but I don't want to keep mixing it up on you. Um, male, um, male velvet ants have wings and they can fly. You'll see them regularly at flowers um, drinking nectar and they will pollinate because they do have hairs and velvet along their body and so they do naturally transmit pollen from one flower to another flower. It may be accidental, but hey, they do it. And so... Um, male velvet ants can be found sugaring at flowers. Um, female velvet ants generally do not have wings. I don't want to say all female velvet ants don't have wings because I feel like there are some that do that I'm not thinking of at the very moment. And insects like to break their own rules. So I hate to say, we, I hate to give hard and fast rules. Um, so I believe most female velvet ants do not have wings and most male velvet ants do and they have the ability to fly. So sometimes when you have a male velvet ant and um, you're just looking at this one individual, it's actually hard to determine sometimes if you have a, uh, a velvet ant or if you have like a scoliad. Um, so there are a handful of different wasps that look very, very similar. So if we wanted to identify a if we wanted to identify a velvet ant <clears throat> and we wanted to say yes for sure this is a velvet ant <clears throat> the characteristic on velvet ants is what we call we call it the velvet line I think I believe we call it the velvet line. It was just in my head, and right when I was talking about it, it disappeared. I hate that. So, I believe it's called a velvet line, but now I'm going to look it up in my notes because it's going to bother me that it might, that might be the wrong word. And so it is, but I know where it is, so I'll show it to you. It's right here. There is this line, and it's kind of a thicker line of hairs here, and that's going to be a characteristic that only mutilids have. Um, now, admittedly, I have a hard time seeing it, and I know that it is there, and I know, like, many other entomologists are like, yeah, it's right there, that line. Felt line. We call it a felt line. That's why it didn't feel right. Velvet ants have felt lines. Um, so her felt line is right here, and that's kind of those, it's an, it's just a stripe on the side of their abdomen that has a thicker set of hairs. Yes, Susan, she is Cetos! I love that. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us a couple of moments to get a rough outline of our friend here. I believe I want to sketch her from a dorsal view, unless we wanted to do her laterally. She could be really cool, too. What do you think? This is up to you. Uh, do you want to sketch her from the top and look at her from the top, or do we want to sketch her from the side? Dorsally or laterally? While we're thinking about it, I'm going to write her name on my paper. So this specimen, Pseudomythoca simula, was collected 
I've just been going through the specimens that I just recently pinned. So this one doesn't even have a label on it yet because it's so new. I collected it in New Jersey over in the Pine Barrens. Um, actually, on the same time that I collected that deer fly and the tiger beetle that we sketched last time. Do top, top dorsally. Perfect. So let's sketch her dorsally first, and then, you know, if we want to, we can turn her all over the place and, and sketch her in a bunch of different directions, too. Let's see. Get this light on so that we can see something. There we go. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to just write her common name, Velvet Ant, here. Um, unfortunately, she doesn't have a common name for her species. There's just the common name for the family that she is in. All right, um, looking at the head, let's see. Let me get my idea of the size of her body. Um, I'm going to start, I always start my sketches with a super light outline of my insect. So I'm going around here, and it's super, super light, and I'm thinking I'm making kind of a rounded box shape for her, for her head here. Um, right about like that. Her, where her thorax connects to her abdomen, right about here, is actually pretty narrow. She's got this little neck going on. And then you can come out and make it nice and wide. This is going to be where all of her muscles are so that she can walk. And I've got to tell you, velvet ants are very, very, like, sturdy. They have very thick exoskeletons, and they are really difficult to, um... They're really difficult to even puncture with a pin. So what I've been doing here while I was <clears throat> chatting with you is on my thorax, I actually sketched three different dividers. This is actually where the legs are also going to be connected. So my first segment of my thorax is up in this region, and it's all the way up here, and it comes down to right about here behind the pin. And then the next segment is right here, and it's essentially this rectangle that comes around. Um, our third segment is here at the very, very end. It's kind of moving away from us, so I just make it, gonna, it's going to be kind of this little triangle because the next segment of the abdomen is going to have to get large again. And I might... We're going to have to see. I might have to shrink my drawing because I might be about to go off the paper. <laughs> I think I am. Yeah, because I can't. Well, my whole body is going to have to be slightly smaller. And you know what? That is why I do these. That is why I... um. I always make sure to do these light sketches because I hate when I get to the end of a sketch and realize that I've been drawing too large. I just like my insect to fill up the paper. I'm going to do this part really quick. <clears throat> so just give me just give me myself an outline. Looks like it's pretty good. So making sure that our abdomen is nice and wide in the front and then comes down to a very fine point up here at the top at the end. Um, crazy thing about uh, velvet ants is they their stinger is fairly long and when they stick it out of their abdomen, they also can kind of aim it. They have um, the ability to kind of turn and aim their stinger, whereas a lot of other wasps and stuff, their stinger just goes up and down. These kind of come out and can kind of search for you. It's wild. Are they particularly found in Pine Barrens? Maybe I'll find them here. Um, velvet ants are not always found in Pine Barrens, um, but they do like 
they do like they're another one of those insects that really like sandy soil so you also find them regularly in the desert um you will also find them around like lakes and streams if it's like a sandier lake um you'll find them around those too kind of like ponds that have sandy soil around them that's where you'll find velvet ants um and the dunes <laughs> Um, I believe that's because of what they parasitize on. Velvet ants are a parasitoid. They feed on something or another that it digs down into the soil. I'd have to look it up. I don't remember. What is the tiniest bug you can pin? Well... That just depends on um, what, how you define pins, um, Susan. So, I think the small, smallest insect that I have pinned personally is this tinged. Um, this is the uh, lace bug. We actually looked at this insect recently, which is why it's out. And this is my normal sized pin. And I have it pinned through a piece of this sponge or a piece of like, essentially, I think this is like pinning foam. Um, and it's a wedge to an even tinier pin. And the lace bug is on the tinier pin on top of the styrofoam on the other pin. So, this is kind of like pinning, right? This is a pin job, um, and it's super, super tiny. This specimen is, two point, is 0.25 centimeters, or um, 2.5 millimeters. Um, you can get smaller, and then if you get any smaller than that, you do something that we call pointing. So instead of putting the pin through the insect, you put the pin through a piece of paper that has a point on the end of it, and you bend the point of the piece of paper, and you put just the littlest itty itty bitty piece of glue on the tip of it, and you mount the insect essentially glued to the end of a piece of paper that is pinned that can go into a drawer. Maybe you will get find one or get stung by one. They are, um, those are both definite options. Uh, be careful. Don't pick them up with your hands. I mean, their stingers are long. I've not been stung yet. I believe that, um, that lace bug, I had to pin underneath a microscope. Like, you can't see an insect like that and put the pin in the right spot. All right, so I'm looking at the edges of the head of my, um, of my velvet ant here, and there's a part of me that really wants to zoom in and check out this texture. Look at all those pivot, those, like, puncture dots. I would call them punctations. I would probably call them punctations. Or little itty bitty holes. All right. Let's see. Where did my camera go? There it is. All right. <clears throat> so the end of the, the back of the head is still pretty square here in the back. Um, you can see that my velvet ant does have some kind of thick velvety hair around her, um, the edges of her head and things. Um, you can go ahead and add those in. My friend here, let's see. We've got some rounded on the back of her abdomen. Abdomen. I said abdomen. I meant thorax. My goodness. I'm really enjoying live streaming every night. It is totally making me tired. But it's so much fun that, like... It's totally worth it. And I've been thinking about it. Um, when it comes into November, I'm probably going to have lots of motivation to do, like, my whiteboard videos and stuff, too. So I'm looking forward to getting all of that uh, moving forward again. Um, so we've got the back side of this head kind of taken care of. Um, these eyes, they are flat, kind of a D shape on the inside. And then 
they're circular, but it honestly, when we look at them dorsally from the direct top, it doesn't look like the eyes are too far over the edge of the head here. Which is unique, you know, most of our insects kind of bulge outside of the head, but I'm thinking that this one is going to look a little better keeping your eyes inside. Um, I always go ahead and cross hatch in here. Um, I'm going to do this when I, when I do it in ink too, so it's just a good reminder for me. So we've got our eyes situated, and then we're coming up here. I do want to change the focus just a little bit because, oh, nope. I wanted to see if we could see any mouth parts, but those are not, no mouth parts there. That's just the antennal sockets and the start of the antenna. Um, if we focus even further down, you'll look um, over there on the right. That's actually her front leg kind of peeking forward over there. It's like one of those candies with the little translucent jewel balls all over it. I see that. Susan, you really want to see hairy eyeballs? I actually have hairy eyeballs right here. If we can get distracted but for two seconds, those are hairy eyeballs. Those are the eyes of a honeybee. All right. But we're doing a velvet ant today. <laughs> Yay, hairy eyeballs. <laughs> it is magnificent. I do love them. We're going to get this lady back in focus. There she is. Hi, friend. All right, we've got the back sides of the head here. We could come in and add some of these longer hairs that are coming off away from the head here. That kind of made my velvet ant look like Hellraiser, so I'm going to have to add more. I hope it doesn't look too much more like a razor. Okay, um, coming on back in. There is, I'm trying to decide how to sketch this. What there is is there's kind of this shelf um, that goes from the head kind of up here in front of the eyes, and then that stops. The antenna come up from underneath that shelf, and that's going to be your scape or the first segment of your antenna. Um, but then this edge of the head continues forward because you also have the mouth parts and the jaws happening down here. And so you have kind of this extra layer. Um, I'll do this so you can see a little better. So there's this like shelf on the top of the head and it's kind of hard to see from here, but then you've got this portion here that um, maybe it doesn't go as high up as I have here. Maybe I'll bring it down just a little bit. Something more like that. But that's going to give you your head shape for your uh, velvet ant. I'm adding some punctation dots. Um, Susan says, no Ocelli? Nope. Oh, yeah. So, let's not catch any endangered butterflies and send them my way. That would make me very sad. 
But if you wanted to catch non-endangered um, butterflies and send them my way, I would be happier. All right, so we are looking at the... backside of the thorax you can kind of see those three segments or the three sections of the thorax once I get it even better into focus let's see that's better all right so oh, I'll back up just a little bit this right here is going to be our first segment of the thorax and it actually does kind of look like there's a pinch right here in the thorax. It reminds me of like somebody took a rubber band on our friend here and just like cinched his thorax a little bit. But this is where that second segment of the thorax starts and you can see that's also where the legs come out. So that's right there on our, we would call it the mesothorax. And then right here at the very end of the thorax, this is our third segment. It's wide here and it comes down to a triangle and it holds the third pair of legs. So if you were going to um, list the names of the pieces of the thorax, you've got the pro, the prothorax, the mesothorax, and the metathorax, um, or pro, meso, and meta. And a lot of times when we're looking at keys, it'll say pro epipleuron or pro mesi epipleuron. And um, they'll kind of tell you where it is on the insect by using pro, meso, or meta. Um, so those are words, the good words to know if you are going to get into insect identification. <laughs> I laugh sometimes because I, 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 uh, when I'm reading like scientific literature, sometimes I read a word and I think, my goodness, that word has to have just been made up. Like, I've never heard that before, and, oh, like, this, this made me laugh. So I was reading this, so we had, we looked at this book recently, the uh, Lace Book Genre of the World, so now it's kind of been sitting on my desk, and I've been reading and flipping through it a little bit, and it's been kind of fun. But they use the word tingifauna for all of the tingids in the world, but instead of making them, instead of saying, like, the species of tinged around the world. They just used, wait, I'm going to do it this way. Oh, no. They just used the word tingifauna, which is the fauna of tingids in the world, and it just made me laugh. <laughs> Sometimes I'm reading scientific literature, and I'm like, really? We're going we're gonna to continue to make up new words? Uh. All right, so we're coming down here. We're going to give our, um, our velvet ant a little bit of a neck. Um, uh, as a guideline, I am going just a little bit inside of the ledge right here. So if I come in a little bit and come down, that's about as wide as I'm making my connection to the thorax. Um, and then that's a pretty kind of a low set feature and so we're gonna bring our thorax up and round it over that um just like let's see we want it to, at its widest point to be about as wide as the head and then curve it over cool um so that's what i've got <laughs> My eraser, stay. My eraser says, you've been using me too much. I'm going to fall out. All right. So, um, there are these really interesting warty looking features on the texturing on its thorax, like right here and right here. And I'm not sure if I've ever zoomed in on one of those before. So I do want to go ahead and zoom in on this after we're done, after I'm done like sketching the entire shape. But I think that that's pretty, I think it's kind of unique. I like it. So,
So I'm going to take the shape of this prothorax and I'm going to just continue and let it round out. And that's kind of the shape that I had originally sketched in. So I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm going to give it kind of that same warty feature over here. But I'm not going to continue the line all the way across because I want to give it that opportunity to... Um, to just look like a, a band around its waist. So uh, my mesothorax, I'm gonna be starting closer to around here, even though I had it starting way up here. And I'm gonna come out and then round down a little bit. I think I went out too far. That's better. And so that's going to be the end of the mesothorax. And I'm going to give it kind of this upward angle before I connect the metathorax, which is essentially going to be this little triangle here. I'm going to make it pretty stout because... I also wanted it to be wider. She kind of ended up with a very narrow thorax. Hmm. Maybe it's too long. Yep. That was it. I'm going to fix this really quick. So sometimes you get it and sometimes you've got to redraw it. And I guess that's okay too. I think what I'm also doing is maybe giving it, making it come in too far. There's something happening here that I want to fix. That's better. Sometimes that left, um, left-handed, right-handed thing will get you when you're drawing one side and then the other side. It'll be like you really like it how it looks on one side and then trying to make it symmetrical sometimes feels like it's impossible. But hey, we got this. All right. That's pretty close-ish. I want this. Now I gotta draw cheat lines. There. That's better. Alright, so now I've got that wider thorax, which is what I was looking for, so that I can have kind of this, this fatter, wider kind of metathorax. That's what I was looking for. I didn't want it to be too narrow and too thin because I want it to be, have enough bulk that we have the ability to kind of add those um, hind legs off of it. Now, I'm pretty happy with my overall body shape here. I've got it pretty well sketched down. Let's go ahead and do the abdomen and then we will come back and sketch the legs. All right. Oh, hey, I missed a couple of, I was, I was really focused, so I missed a couple of chats. So I'm going back and reading. <coughs> um, Susan asked, do Hymenoptera not have pronotum? Um, they do. Hymenopteran do have pronotums. They have also have pronotal regions. Um, with the pronotum, 
on a velvet ant that would be down here kind of buried in this neck region we might be able to see the pronotum if we looked at the ant from the side i could show you the sclerite that would be considered the pronotum but from the top um we're not seeing that first connection between the head and the thorax which would be our like that first section of our thorax which would be the pronotum um so they are built just a little bit differently, but um, those regions do exist on wasps and bees also. They're just sometimes a little bit more buried. Um, yes, and as always, one pair of legs comes from each part of the thorax. Yes, pro leg from the prothorax, meso leg from the mesothorax, and the meta leg from the metathorax. <laughs> So if somebody said the metacoxy, you would know that that is the hind legs coxy. Or if somebody said the protibia, you would know that that is the second segment of the leg of the first leg, the protibia, right? So that's what we're getting to is being able to put all of these words together in different, in different ways um, so that when you're reading it, it doesn't throw you off. Um, because it can. You, you have to take all of these little bits and pieces of things, you know, and put them together and kind of come up and come up with identifications. Um, it actually looks so perfectly like a glassy wine berry. Oh, yes. I would have to agree with that. It does look edible, although it does also look like it would be super painful. So we don't want to try and eat it. Um, actually, if we focus down, we can... Nope, that's the leg, not the stinger. I'm like, we will be able to see the stinger a little bit later, because I want to show it to you. And it's sticking out. All right. You know how nasty blackberry thorns can be? <laughs> Wineberries are so much worse. I guess that's true. Wineberries also have, like, a series of thick thorns, and they have a series of, like, narrow, hairy, like, spiky thorns that stick with you. So, yeah, wineberries are no fun. If you want to branch out into invertebrates where you don't have to worry about symmetry, how about fiddler crabs? Fiddler, are fiddler crabs not symmetrical? Oh, ha, 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 oh, that's great. Yeah, I could do that. One leg that's ginormous. Was she red before she died? Yes. Um, velvet ants like her are super duper bright red um the bright red is a warning sign um we call it there's actually a term for warning colors we call it aposomatic coloration and um aposomatic coloration just means that these this is a uh, warning colors. So bright red, bright orange, bright yellow, I'm poisonous, I'm venomous, I hurt, don't bite me. That's aposomatic coloration. And this velvet ant in particular is like, I sting and will hurt you like a crazy gut person. So don't touch me. Um, yeah, I have giant stinger, don't touch. That's what aposomatic coloration tells us. Now, when I'm looking at this species, Pseudomatheca simula, um, and I'm trying to, I, when I was going through and identifying my specimen here down to species, I, I personally went off of color in the abdomen and shape of the body. Um, so, if we are looking here at the abdomen, Pseudomatheca simula is... Um, all of the images of it show it having these two lighter patches on the abdomen and it's not super easy to see on the microscope i think it's just because the lighting is a little odd but these are kind of they are a significant color change so we've got this dark red here and then we have kind of these two really large almost orange red spots um and those are going to be significant 
And then moving down our abdomen, I'm actually, when we get to those segments, I'm going to be turning our specimen to the side because the abdomen kind of curled down. And I want to show you that at every single abdominal segment change, there's a series of white hairs. They're really felty and look kind of fluffy. So let's go ahead and sketch these first two segments of the abdomen, and then we'll turn our specimen and look at the rest. So the first segment is right here where that dark line stops. That's where the first segment stops. This whole thing here is the second abdominal segment. We would call it A2. Yes, Susan. Pro, meso, and meta. Front, middle, back. Are these lovelies on the sting index of that one guy? Uh, I believe they are. And I have that book right here in front of me, so we might as well look it up. This is The Sting of the Wild. It's written by a man named Justin O. Schmidt. And he is a really cool dude. And he said, with the best of... With, with the best regards, go Bugs! He signed my book. I was all excited to meet him. All right. So, um, let's see. <clears throat> I'm looking up the species to see if he's ever been specifically stunned by one of these. And if not, I'll give you the reading for the Velvet Ants. It doesn't look like he's been stung by this individual species, but Mutilla europea is a species of velvet ant, so let's go look at that one. Give me a second. It might, might take me a minute to find it. Aha! Uh -huh. All right. This is Daisy Mutilla Klugii. Um, and he says it was a huge velvet ant. So this might be a little bit stronger than this smaller velvet ant we have here. But Justin Schmidt got stung by Daisy Mutilla Klugii, and he rated it a pain level of 3 out of 4. So if you imagine a 2 as being stung by a natural, like a honeybee or a yellow jacket, it was worse than that. And... His description of the sting was explosive and long-lasting. You sound insane as you scream. Hot oil from the deep fryer spilling over your entire hand. That's what it feels like to be stung by a larger version of this velvet ant. Hot oil spilling from the deep fire fryer over your entire hand. Ow! So that's no good. Don't get stung by one. He asked for it, literally, for science. I did get it autographed. I've met Justin Schmidt twice now, and I laugh because... Um, it doesn't matter if you're in the middle of winter and you're in, like, Washington State or if you're, like, in the middle of the desert in the middle of the summer. He is wearing open-toed shoes and shorts. And I'm like, Justin, <laughs> this is why you get stuck all the time. You wear sh open-toed shoes in the desert. Um, but, you know, it's what he does. Now, did he try spilling hot oil over his hand for comparison? <laughs> That's a wonderful question, and I don't believe so. Um, Justin is just a really, like,
like, imaginative guy. He's really awesome. And he has this just really wonderful way with words. Um, and he has this great way with descriptions. So I, so, you know, he can describe something to you and neither you or him has felt it, but you know how it might feel, right? And you know that, yowch, you don't want that, ha that to happen. Um... I like the one, and I don't even remember what the sting was from, but he has a description that says, um, uh, Poseidon has rammed his trident into your chest. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, it was like, gods do exist. Poseidon has rammed his trident into your chest. And sometimes I wonder, and I've been, and I've been, next time I meet him, I'll ask him, um... I wonder if, if, like, the locations that he describes in his, like, descriptions of pain are where he got stung. Like, if he, if spilling hot oil over your hand was the pain, I wonder if he got stung in the hand. Um, because he also has one that says, like, um... Like dipping a Q-tip in habanero and sticking it up your nose. And I just personally feel like... I wonder if he got stung in the nose somehow. You know? I'm curious. I just think all the things. Are these what people call red ants? Um, when I was a child, I called every ant that was red, red ants. Um, but a lot of times when people are talking about red ants in particular, they're generally talking about the red imported fire ants. Um, those can get, um, those can get shortened into RIFA, R-I-F-A, if you wanted to look them up. Um, but those RIFA, um, are true ants. Um, when they sting, it feels like you're being poked by a hot needle, and then it doesn't hurt anymore. But the bump then swells into this white pustule, and it itches like mad. Oh, hi, Chaos! Good morning! Um, he was getting stung on purpose, right? Um, I believe so, yes. He, uh, Justin Schmidt actually started off as a, um, as a toxicologist. So he was, when he went to school and he studied, he actually studied mostly chemistry, um, and then he became very interested in insect venoms and how they worked and how they reacted in the human body, and then, you know, I'm sure he got naturally stung in the process, and there wasn't an index for him to rate things, and because he was a scientist, he just started rating them, and then, you know... Um, he had gotten stung enough that now he's got an index named after him. Created it, built it, wrote the book, sold it. Wild. Yes, we are. Chaos, we are talking about Justin Schmidt, like the sting of the wild, um, because we were, we were talking about him because we wanted to know if, um, if this species of velvet ant was in the book. This species of velvet ant was not in the book, but we did find a different one. It was rated a three out of four. <clears throat> All right, we are going to move our specimen. I got my first two abdominal segments mostly sketched out, and I want to look at the rest of the segmentation. So I'm going to go over here to my microscope really quick. I just want to see what might be the best angle for us to see all of the part, all of the final abdominal segments, and I want to see a little bit of the stinger. But my foot is in the way! Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so at this angle, those two spots look significant now. You can see that those are those really bright orange spots on the back of its abdomen. So you've got those two spots here. Now, if that's A2, the next segment, which is right here, that's A3. This one is A4, and this final one at the very end is A5. So we have three more segments to sketch, and they get smaller and smaller. And as you can imagine, they are stepped just a little bit. So um, you go in from your last segment a little bit. Make sure you're always going to narrow. And then you're doing three more segments. So that would be a three. This would be a four. And then we want a five to end all the way in that point. And if you've got it nicely in steps and even, then you can, then I'm going to come back here and kind of darken some of these lines and finalize them a little bit. Um, if this is a sketch that I become very proud of, we might actually incline it also because I need a nice, um, I need a nice ant in my, um, in my stuff. Even though it's a velvet ant and not a true ant. So we've got a head, we've got a thorax, we've got an abdomen. We have the, I, um, I personally just sketched the scape, which was this first segment here. That was mostly because I wanted to see how my front legs were going to interact. Um... Now, let's see. At the edges of every single one of these abdominal segments, there are these longer white hairs. And these, like, these very light white hairs do reflect really well. And so when you see one of these specimens um, in real life, and if you take a picture of one, um, it almost looks like it has these two orange spots and then it has these three white stripes. Um, and these aren't exactly, these are stripes that are just made by these long hairs on the end of the segments. Um, are you able to flip it over to see the stinger? And is the stinger also functional as an ovipositor? With that bendy abdomen, you can see how it's able to aim the stinger. Yes! All right, with the bendy abdomen, yes, it can aim the stinger, but it also has muscles at the base of the stinger that help kind of move the um, stinger around, which is like the adaptation. Um, are you able to flip it over? I'm going to flip it over so you can see what I see. because she's mostly just like actively stinging her own foot. That's a little better. All right, so this right here, oops. So this right here is the last abdominal segment and then this is a part of her stinger. Now at this point her stinger is only out um, just a little bit and so this is not the full length of her stinger. This is probably only about a quarter of her stinger. Um, if I was going to show you kind of the length of her stinger against her abdomen, her stinger should be about Probably a little less than half of the length of her abdomen. And then it can angle. And the abdomen can angle. She, um, she's dangerous. Is the stinger also functional ovipositor? I would love to answer that, and I've avoided that question the first time because I wasn't sure, um... I feel like it has to be. So, 
when the velvet ant females, they do sting and paralyze their prey. They lay an egg in it, and they, it's buried in the sand. So, I'm going to answer yes. They functionally can both sting with their venom and lay their eggs with their stinger. I can't imagine that they're laying their eggs with a different organ because the alvapositor is originally an egg-laying device. Are there tibial spurs on the legs? Yes. Um, this right here is actually the end of the tibia. So if you see right here, that kind of lighter spur, that's going to be our tibial spur. And then we have one, two, three, four, five tarsal segments and two tarsal claws. interested and I'm still not sure what the function is I haven't looked it up or anything but because we're looking at the specimen I'm about we're about to sketch the legs but look at this there's like a there's a cavity on the side of the thorax um, and it looks like it could essentially fit the middle leg and maybe the hind leg too. And I've never seen a velvet ant roll into a ball. You know, it's not going to be doing that. So this is something I think is really kind of awesome. It's wild. I can't think of any other reason why an insect would have a like a divot like that in its thorax unless it was to tuck the legs in. Um, I'm just not exactly sure why. Yeah. Oh, Hashi would like to know how long should we draw the stinger? Um, for me, I just drew the stinger pretty short. Um, I know about how long it is in its body, and if you wanted to, you could make it significantly longer. Um, I just made it short like it was just barely kind of sticking out, just like our specimen was. Um, but... You know what would be better is I can show you a specimen where its um, stinger is fully extended so you know what it looks like. a thistle down velvet ant and instead of it being a really pretty red and black color striping um, this specimen um, this specimen is white
love Thistle Down Velvet Ants, but unfortunately, I've had too many people say that they don't like drawing white things because they're hard to sketch, so, you know. You can see most of its entire length, um, so maybe not less than half, maybe about a third. Um, about a, th um, a third into the abdomen. So if you wanted to do a full length stinger like you see here, um, when you're sketching your velvet ant, um, you can look at your abdomen as a whole, divide it into thirds, and then make the stinger that long. Um, it's likely going to end up being about the length of the last three segments, is my guess. <clears throat> it looks like a long-haired rodent. I could see that, but, you know, my... A thistle down velvet ant. I was so excited to catch it. I I can't even tell you. I thought that it was a little seed pod, like floating across the ground. I didn't even know it was an insect. Um, and then I realized that there was no wind, so like there was no way there was an ins um like a seed pod blowing across the ground. And so I was like, wait a minute. And then um, after that, I got down on my hands and knees to look at it, and I was like, that's an insect. And then I got all excited, like, I believe that was in New Mexico. Let me check. Yep, yeah, New Mexico. Over at Angel Peak. Honestly, if any of you all are ever out in New Mexico, you should go to Angel Peak. It's a scenic area, and it is free camping. And it is the most beautiful canyon um, that you will ever see for free. So I believe that my last um, tarsal segment on this leg got knocked off. Um, so if you want, you can draw the rest of the leg and then skip the last one so you can see what the middle ones and the hind ones look like. They're going to be very, very similar. Um, ah, sorry about that. We don't mean to break our specimens. Did anyone read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell? I did not. I loved it, but it's a very particular style. Oh. All right, so my, um, my, my mutilid, my velvet ant, is going to have its femurs. Oh, these are the words for the legs. We have the femur. Ah, uh, femus. We have the femur. It's that bone. It's the section between the hip and the knee. It's that first segment. So right here before it bends, that's considered the femur. Also, the femur is the bone between our hip and our knee. So it's an easy way to remember it. Now, the next one after the femur is the tibia. No, the tibia, of course. Um, and the tibia is that bone in between our knee and our ankle. Hey, guess what? It's this section right here. So it goes femur and then tibia. And then the last one does differ a little bit from humans, but it's not all the way different. So we call these tarsi. Um, humans, our toe bones are called metatarsi. All right, so they're kind of like the same word, just humans get um, metatarsy. Um, now, 
Um, if you wanted to say an individual tarsal segment, the word changes from tarsi with an I to tarsal with an AL. So that's how we say it singular. So you can say the second tarsal segment or it has five tarsi. Um, and then at the very, very end of the leg, you've got the tarsal claw. And that is, then those are the, essentially, a lot of times it's two claws at the end of the leg. Are our finger bones pro tarsi? I have no idea. Let me look it up. Names of human finger bones. You know, the only reason I know anything about human anatomy are the, um, are the uh, names that I can relate back to insects. We call them phalanges. So our fingers are phalanges. And you're right, I do wonder about the, why they are the metatarsi, metatarsal bones. I was hoping we had a protarsal bone, but I'm not sure where that would be. I don't see it. Nope, just metatarsa, tarsals. And they say metatarsals instead of metatarsi, like it should be based on its root. Can I call my upper arm my pro-femur? <laughs> I love that! Then you could get into the Olympics with your pro-femurs! <laughs> oh, that's the best. So my femur comes back a little bit, kind of like it's coming out towards us. I've been teaching a lot recently um, during the day and um, then again at night and then doing live streams. I might lose my voice at some point. I can feel it going every now and again. And I am on the news in the morning again to give good luck to the Phillies. See, the last time I was there, I won. They won. And then I left and they lost. So the newsroom invited me back out so that I could give the Phillies good luck again. So their tibia corresponds to our tibia and fibula. fibula. Are those the names for our lower leg bones? So their tibia corresponds to our tibia and fibula. Are those the names for our lower leg bones? Ah, yes. Our, our bone between our knee, our patella, and our ankle is called the tibia. And that's what they're named after. I honestly don't remember what the fibula is. Oh, it's the smaller bone next to the tibia. Right, got it. So they only have the tibia. Phalanges, singular, is phalanx. Cool. Hi, Caitlin. I hope you are doing well. We are finishing up. We are working on a, um, a Velvet Ant um, sketch and getting distracted by the names of bones um, because we started talking about the different segments in the insect's leg, the femur, the tibia, and the tarsi, um, and then we ended up talking about human bones like the fibula and the phalanges because this is just a wonderful group of people and we get on wonderful sidetracked conversations. <laughs> 
And then I wonder why it takes me an hour and a half to draw things sometimes. <laughs> oh. So, that's what it is. Um, is there any similar segment that's analogous to our talus bone? I would love to give you that answer, um, Avea. Let me look up what the talus bone is. My guess is that it's... Oh! That's a complicated answer. Um... Coxa femur, coxa trochanter, femur, patella, tibia, no. All right, so, um, Avea, I've thought through your question. So my guess, your, your question is, is there a similar segment that's analogous to the talus bone, meaning a segment right here in between the tibia and the tarsal segments right here that kind of help with the mo movement and the joint? The answer is no. The tarsi tarsal segments connect directly to the tibia. But insects do have connecting joints here between the femur and the tibia and here between the coxa and the femur. And we don't normally talk about them. I normally just skip right over them because generally you can't see them because they're kind of embedded in there. But if you want all of the names from the base of the hip to the end of the tarsal segments, I can give them to you. So, that first segment is the hip bone, and that's what we call the coxy, um, or coxa for individual. Um, next, you have the bone that's called the trochanter. This is a connection in between the coxa and the femur. And so then, obviously, you have the femur, <clears throat> that I like to type femus for some reason. So we've got the femur, and then after that, I'm going to erase this and go again. So after the femur, we have the patella, which is the same as our knee bone. Um, then we have the tibia, and then we have the tarsi. Whew. But normally, two or three of those segments are not visible while we're sketching, and so I generally don't talk about them. So they don't have ankles. No, they just have a series of tarsal segments that can bend and move. It's almost like having three or four ankles. Like, because all of these segments bend. If you're obsessed with anatomy, I'm down. We can keep we we can keep going. I love it. You know, um, I just wanted. It just took me an extra minute to 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 think to think about it. Um, and I will answer as many questions as you can ask me that I have the ability of answering that I know. You know, I am obviously not going to know it all. Insects are a huge science, and nobody knows it all. Um, but I can, um, I can uh, throw my hat in the rink. I'm pretty good. I know my bugs. I love my bugs. So our, um, our velvet ant has five tarsal segments. It just doesn't have five tarsal segments on this leg because it dropped one off. So the first one is nice and long. Two, three, four, and admittedly five are all going to be the same length. Um, two, three, and four are all these triangular cones that are stacked on top of each other. And they're all about half of the length of the first one. And so you have all of these kind of... Um, you have kind of these stacked triangles on top of each other, but then the last tarsal segment is not a triangle. It's more like the top of the ice cream cone. It's kind of roundy like that. And then you've got the two claws that are coming off of it. And you'll be able to see on the middle and the hind legs a little bit.
natatorial or saltatorial meso legs. And I feel like having weird meso legs on any, like any type of weird meso legs would be difficult because they're the ones in the middle. Now, if you were talking about raptorial front legs or pro legs, I would be down for that. Um, but if I had to choose between grabbing with my middle legs, jumping with my middle legs, or swimming, I would go swimming. Because then I could also have natatorial hind legs and be kind of even and maybe swim straight. I'm trying to find, what I'm doing right now is trying to find a good angle that we can view the middle legs from. As it turns out, when I pinned this specimen, I didn't set the legs really well. They're kind of curled all over the place. The hind legs look good. We're just going to look at the hind legs. Check that out. All right, so what we're looking at here is the femur, the tibia, and the tarsal segments. If we looked really closely in here, you might see, and you can't see it. You really can't. It's in there, I promise. There's a little itty bitty, uh, what you would, you would call this a, a patella, right? Yeah, the patella is in there. Um, and then the trochanter would be back here. We would have to flip the insect over to see it. Um, so femur, you also have, this is the end of the tibia, and right here at the end of the tibia, the spines, the spurs are a lighter color instead of being black and sclerotized like the legs. Um, but these are a lighter colored here, but they're still tibial spurs. I would still consider them tibial spurs. Susan, I feel like jumping really high with your middle legs is a bad idea. I feel like you would just spin in circles. We were talking earlier about how being an expert doesn't mean knowing absolutely everything. Yes. I guess that's very true. And there's this really interesting thing that happens because you can go with, there's this like wonderful chart, and I don't want to draw it too dark, but um, there's this wonderful chart that goes like um, knowledge um, and like... Um, Um, it goes knowledge and then confidence. And then there's this crazy thing that happens because you first start learning things and you're learning things and you're really excited and you're like gaining all of this confidence. And there's some point in the very beginning of learning about a topic that you're so confident that you know it all. You're like, this is awesome. I know this and that and the other thing. And I'm like, and I'm on the top of the world. And then you learn more and you learn more and your confidence starts to drop. And you start to realize that like, that, like, you don't know as much as you thought you did, right? But you never go all the way down because you still, you know, you have the knowledge and it's all the things. But, like, there's definitely this interesting curve that happens where you're like, I know it all. And then as you learn things, you're like, oh, wait. Oh, wait. No, I don't. I need to, um, I definitely need to go back and study. And then you look back at the people who are saying, I know it all. And thinking, oh, you just wait. <laughs> just wait until you open the rest of the box, you know? thing is, I feel like that's very dangerous if you don't have, also have wings to help control the fall. Um, for jumping, you mean? I feel like it should be fine, because fleas jump without, 
without wings. And a lot of leaf hoppers, they jump before they have wings. Um, keep in mind our middle legs are coming out from this region back here. They're going to come up, they're going to come back, and they're going to come out. That's kind of our overall shape. And then our hind legs are going to be coming out a little bit further back, and I'm going to make them go out a little bit more and then back like this so that they're not walking on each other. So this is the angle that my legs are going to go at. The Dunning-Kruger effect. Is that what it's called? Thank you. You were discussing it in Jack Law's class earlier? <laughs> oh, that's so much fun. See, there is a little bit of a, uh, there is a little bit of a, um, like an overlap. All right, so we've got this femur. We have the tibia. Admittedly, the tibia are not as long as I expect them to be. They're actually kind of stout for an insect, especially for an insect that lives in the desert. A lot of times, desert-dwelling insects have very long, thin legs because, um, they don't want to have kind of short stubby legs because they have to run over the sand and sometimes your feet get buried So if you have taller legs, it helps you run a little bit better um, But I guess She says I don't need no long legs. I've got enough strength right here One Two Three Four five and the claws and the two tibial spurs. And then hind legs. Femur. The tibia on the hind legs are a little bit longer than the tibia on the other two pair of legs were. So we've got the tibia. And these two tibial spurs. And then our tarsal segments. One, two, three, four, five. All right. She's kind of beautiful. I kind of love her. Oh, let's get the antenna done. Derp. Let's see. Scape. Flagellum. Her pedestal. And then. My front legs didn't come all the way up here, so I don't have to worry about it running over. There we go. That gives me a little bit of a better idea about the the antenna here. I'm trying to figure out how this curl goes. I feel like it goes in the other direction, but I don't understand how. No, it can't go that way. Don't mind me while I draw a bunch of curly cues in front of my antenna trying to figure out which direction it goes. I believe that it goes in this direction. Yeah. 
And so I'm going to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, approximately 11 segments in this curly cue. And that is my friend Pseudomythoca simula. Oh, that's so funny. From the top, draw a sine wave rather than a twist. I think we got it. I'm happy with... Like this? I don't know. I think I, I think she's happy. So, um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me. We did make it the entire 90 minutes. Um, and this has been an absolute blast. A spiral viewed from the side looks like a sine wave from the top. I'll have to, I'll have to work on that. Thank you so much, Susan. All right, so I want to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me today. I always super appreciate it, and I love seeing and talking with each and every one of you. It really means the world to me that you join me and have been joining me every day of the month for Invertober. This has been a wild experience, but I have somebody here chatting with me every night, and that is a, a wonderful thing that I get all excited about, and sometimes I think about it and I get goosebumps. Um, so thank you for supporting me and hanging out with me and um you know we're all gonna learn and love about love bugs together so i also teach on a platform called out school this is a platform not for adults it's for kids ages five to eight nine to twelve and um students can pay to join me um once a week uh as part of weekly insect studies or junior bug club and we learn about a new bug every week and it's through zoom so you also get to meet the other bug loving students which is also really kind of cool. I have students from all over the world, including Hawaii and China and Canada and um, all over the United States. So it's a wonderful thing. Now, um, please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have not already. Um, there is a little subscribe button down there. There's also the little bell notification. You can just go ahead and click that. That lets you know that I'm live. Um, and because I'm going live every night, you want those notifications, right? Now, um, this right here is a QR code to my PayPal. It's just your, it's just um, how you can go ahead and tip me for the class. If you've really enjoyed the class, if you've learned something, if you're taking something away from it, um, you're going to go and show off your sketch to somebody. I always appreciate a couple of dollars. I know that all many, many of you have already donated to, um, to Insectopia in support of me and my collection and keeping this moving and keeping this uh, program that continues. And I always, always, always appreciate it. It really makes it worth it. So thank you so much. Um, along with, obviously, the comments and interaction and all the things. Um, down here, it says, at Insectopia 2015. That's because on Facebook and on Instagram, I am still at Insectopia 2015. So if you can't find me at Insectopia, that's why. Add those four digits. All right. Yay! All right. Thank you so much, ladies.
ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Um, tomorrow we're doing ink. Saturday I will be we'll be spreading dust head moths. Sunday we're gonna sketch another bug, and then Monday is gonna be wonderful because we're meeting my chinchillas. So come join us on Monday night and um, hang out with me and my mammals. All right, Yahoo! Um, have a wonderful wild night and stay buggy.